We're serving a big God. We touched on a little of this. It's hard sometimes not to be able to teach Sunday school and then turn right around and preach. And a lot of times we get in the middle of both because it's all on your mind at one time. But let's read from the 14th verse of the third chapter. Our text is found in the 15th verse. Now, if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbolt, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. He said, well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And my text this morning is, or the thought is, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? And Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And then the Bible said, then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. I mean, he was totally out of sorts. He was mad as a hornet, we used to say. He got mad. He got angry. He was... Killing rage, he was ready to go to war. Let's pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you, we love you. Settle our hearts and our minds this morning, and God, defeat the enemy that would hinder us from hearing what you have to say. Speak to us from heaven this morning, Lord. Deal with our hearts and with our lives. Lord, in a manner of drawing nearer unto us, and help us, Lord, to draw nearer unto you. Touch the hearts and the lives of those that are lost. Save, Lord, and heal and deliver, Lord, and loose men and set them free. Lord, it can be done by the preaching of the word this morning. And we'll love you and we'll praise you and give you all the honor and the glory. We desire your precious anointing around about this place, Lord, for the next few moments of time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Most of you have understood by the Bible reading, Nebuchadnezzar decided he was going to make him a golden image. Carried it through the streets, and when the horns blew and the harps played and all kinds of music came about, everybody as that big golden image came down the road. They were supposed to bow down and worship it. Be the same thing if somebody decided that they were going to do this in High Point or Greensboro or Winston. And as they came down the street and you were standing on the street corner. And we're not talking about nodding your head. We're not talking about bowing from your waist. We're talking about falling flat on your face and worshiping that image. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego didn't have a whole lot of choice in the natural They were slaves. They had been brought there from Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar came in and overthrew Jerusalem. You know the story of how that he took all of the young strong men and took all those and he left those that were weak and uh, probably those that had uh, poor minds and those that were lame and crippled, he left all them in Jerusalem. Those were the ones that uh, Jeremiah was responsible for and the ones that he prayed for. And, but we find that Nebuchadnezzar took the cream of the crop. He took the best that Israel had to offer there in Jerusalem. Took them back down into Babylon. And this is what he was putting them through. You see, it makes no difference where you at. The devil is going to do all he can to try to destroy you. You could be in the house of kings, you can be in uh, a mansion on a hillside, or you can be down in the smallest hovel. The man that lives with the least fights the same enemy 
Maybe a different manner in a different way, but he fights the same enemy because the devil is the enemy this morning. And these young men, and we're not talking about grown men, we're talking about young lads, we're talking about young people. These young men, as they uh, stood there on the side of the road, there were some that went running to the king and said that, O oh, king, great king Nebuchadnezzar, said we want you to know that you've got three that are not going to do anything. They don't bow down when the image comes by. They don't bow down when the harp is played. They don't bow down when the trumpet is sounded. They don't bow down. Makes no difference what goes on. They just don't bow. They're not going to bow. And the king had brought them before him. And asked them the question and said, Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? I'm here to tell you, church, it don't take God long to change the minds of a man, he may be, uh, feel like that he's got it all and he can be the king. But God's got a way of changing the minds of the king. We've got folks that don't believe that God's able to change. But he's able to change the mind of judges. God's able to change the minds of wicked wives and wicked husbands. He can bring children back into subjection under their parents in just a matter of moments. It may not be in a manner and a way that you're pleased with. And these young men had to take a stand before they could get the devil off their back. Now I'm here to tell you this morning it didn't take long for old Nebuchadnezzar to get religion because on down just a few verses under this, listen to what he has to say. He said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted him. It didn't take long for Nebuchadnezzar to get religion. It didn't take long for him to realize that God was God, that God was on the throne. We lose sight many times of the fact that God is God. Could you say it with me this morning? That God is God. Hallelujah. Say it again this morning. God is God. Hallelujah. I'm glad this morning that he's on the throne. But he's here this morning to meet the needs of his people. God's not forsaken us. He's not give up on us. God's still on the throne. He's still able just like he did in Nebuchadnezzar's time. God can take Nebuchadnezzar and turn him around. He can take me and you but we might have to go through the fiery furnace in order to see it done you say brother Whistler, what are we going to do we're going to trust God that's what those young men told him that's what those young men said Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king O Nebuchadnezzar he said we're not careful to answer thee in this matter Nebuchadnezzar had raised up and challenged God. Who is that God that's going to keep you out of my hands? Who is that God that can do this and can do that? And this is what the world is saying to us. There, uh, you're not on trial. You're not on trial. You don't have to prove a thing this morning. The only thing God has told us to do is to love him and to live for him and to serve him, to follow after him, to be just as good as he asks us to be. And I'm talking about that's all the Lord wants us to do. But you don't have to perform any miracles. You can't perform a miracle. You don't have to heal anybody that's sick nor raise anybody from the dead. That's God's job. You don't have to worry about saving anybody. The only thing the Lord told you was to plant some seed or to water behind where somebody else has already planted seed. God will do the saving this morning. Uh, it's left up to us. But Nebuchadnezzar had set himself up as God. Who is going to pull you out of my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looked over at him and said, Well, I'll tell you, it's just like this, fella. And we can put it in the vernacular of today. If he saves us, it's good and well. If we got to go into the fiery furnace, if that's all right too. In other words, if we live, we live. If we die, we die. But we're still going to trust God. We're putting our trust and our hope and our dependence in Him. He is our hope. He is our trust. He is our all in all. We're going to believe God. And that's the way that we're going to have to do. If you're going to be a Christian this morning, when hard times come, it makes no difference what comes our way. We're going to trust God. 
God. You may have to walk through hell on this earth. You may have to walk through and fight some hard battles. You may have to face some hard things before it's over with. But I'm telling you that God is the victory on the other side of the battle. He said, hold your peace. The battle is the Lord's. Hallelujah. The victory is ours this morning. But you got to keep on believing in him. You got to keep on believing in him. I looked at a place in scripture that's a very familiar scripture to you. And I saw that there was a man by the name of David went out to fight a battle. And we know that David walked out into that valley and, and, and he didn't go out with armor. He didn't go out with a shield. He didn't go out with a sword. And there was a man that was almost 10 foot tall. And some say he was 10 foot tall, going on 11. But it didn't make any difference. David said, look. He said, you come against me with a sword and with a shield. But he said, I come against you in the name of the Lord. Amen. In the name of the Lord of hosts. He said, I don't come against you and David. Old Goliath had stood out there and said, come on to me. Said, come on to me. You know how you've seen folks wanting to fight. Said, come on. Come on. Let's get it on. Come on. And that's what Goliath was telling David. Why you little puny weakling of a man. Little old boy out here in the middle of the valley getting ready to fight a full size grown warrior. And that was exactly what it was. Man on the surface it was lopsided. On the surface it looked like that David would be ground under the heel and under the might of Goliath. But isn't that the way it is with us? How many times have we come to face the battle and it looked like that we were in the minority and it looked like that we were going to lose oh but God gave the victory hallelujah he said little is much when God is in it honey when we trust the Lord this morning we can go and we can make it and we can stand hallelujah he said you come to me Come on. He said, I'll feed your flesh to the fowls of the air. David looked over at him. He said, oh, Goliath. He said, you come against me. He said, with a sword and with a shield and with a buckler. He said, you come with all the armor. But he said, I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. We know what the end of the battle was. That's just the same thing. It was God on one side and the devil on the other. That's the way it always is. That's the way it'll always be be that's the way it is in the land and the time and the hour which we're living it's God on one side and the devil on the other you're going to have to choose up which side you're going to fight for Amen. And you think maybe just because you fought a battle and won that the devil go back over yonder in the corner and he sit down and he cry don't kid yourself Elijah had been up on top of Mount Carmel had one of the greatest victories that we see in all of the Old Testament. You know there was almost a thousand of those priests and what have you out there that were fighting and, and doing all their thing against Elijah. You remember the story of the altar and how many barrels of water they put in it and how they put the sacrifice on and all that sort of stuff. You remember what all went on. And you remember when Elijah prayed that little short prayer and fire fell from heaven and consumed the altar, consumed the sacrifice. And, 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 and one of the greatest of the miracles about it, Brother Ferris, was this. It licked up the water. Yes. Now water in the natural don't burn. But the water burnt. I'm talking about it was a great and a marvelous victory for the Lord. And it wasn't but just a few short days later. Let me read you what the scripture said. Just a few short days later. Here come Jezebel and here come uh, Elijah. And, they, and for somewhere or other they met. And let's see if I can tell you what she said. She told him in just so many words. 
So let the gods do to me and more also. Was talking about those prophets that died. Said let God do the same thing to me. And more also if I make nothing. Not if I make not thy life as the life of one of, the, of them by tomorrow this time. She told Elijah she said I'm going to take your life. And she said, I'm going to do to you just exactly what your God did unto my prophets and to my servants and to my people that was up there on that mountain. Said, I'm going to do the very same thing to you. And said, you just believe it like it is. Let the gods do to me. Take my life if I don't do it. She swore on her own life. And I want, I want you to hear what, what God spoke through this man by the name of Elijah. He said, in the portion of Jezreel shall the dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. Neighbor, when God speaks, and he spoke to us through this precious book, he's told us what he said, and he said just exactly what he said, and he meant just every word of it from cover to cover. Can you believe everything that he said in this book? You know, we got folks today that said, well, that was Elijah, and God worked with Elijah, but he won't work with me. I'm telling you, the Bible said God is not a respecter of persons. He'll do for you just like he said he would do. He'll do for me just exactly what he said he'd do. He's not a liar. He's not a man that he should lie. The Bible said the son of man that he should repent. God is God this morning, church. He's on the throne. He is all powerful. It's not just something back yonder. He's all powerful today. Hallelujah. In 1999, in the month of April, hallelujah, God will do just exactly what he said he would do. If you can believe this, he said all things are possible to him that believeth. We're just calling back, looking back at what God did through Elijah. You think, well, maybe that that just went unheeded and unpaid any attention to. Jehu came into Jezreel. Jezebel set up in a, I, I, I just say a two or three story apartment or house. She lived in that place. And she seen Jehu coming in. She knew he was a man of God. She recognized him for who he was. What did she do? The Bible says she ran and painted her face. I ain't making it up. Look right there. That's exactly what it said. She ran and painted her face. And, and plaited her hair. Dressed her hair up. And she got over in that window. And she leaned out and she would bend just about like the young ones are. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm the queen. You can't do anything about it. And she began to taunt. That's what the scripture says. She began to make fun. She poked fun at Jehu. Well, Jehu was a general of the armies of Israel. He said, all. Said, who's for me? That's what he said. He said, who's for me? Evidently, there was a group of those men said, we're on your side. He said, go up and throw her down. They went up and cast her down. And he didn't stay there to watch her hit the ground. The Bible said he went on down. I don't know whether he went to a restaurant, whether he went to a private home, but he went somewhere and eat supper. And after he got through eating, Brother Vic, I'm showing you just exactly what... Uh, just what the queen was. Nobody didn't raise no voice in her behalf. Nobody didn't say anything. She'd been as mean as the devil wanted her to be. And people were glad to see her gone. But the Bible said when she hit the ground. That her blood sprinkled onto the wall and onto the horses. Well that don't sound too bad. Well, after he got through eating, he said, some of you get together, let's go back up here and bury that woman. And when they got back, what did they find? Found her skull and her feet. And some of you done had your hands up and the palms of her hands. That was all that was left. The dogs 
had eat and licked up the blood and carried off all the bones. I reckon the reason they left the head was simply because they couldn't get their mouth open wide enough to get it in. And her palms are so dirty from doing the work of the devil, I don't guess they wanted them. I mean, that represented the hands. And her feet had been in enough trouble that nobody didn't want them. I mean, why in the world would they want them? Why? She could have had little feet, but I don't think the dogs would have took them. I believe it was an indication that the Lord said, leave it there and leave it alone. She's done created. She was one of the most, I wouldn't name a child Jezebel. Nor Delilah. It's just the connotation of what they are. That child could grow up and, 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 and you call her Delilah and she could be the finest little lady and the finest mother and the best person in this world. But I wouldn't name one of my youngins Delilah. And I wouldn't name a daughter of mine or I wouldn't want a daughter or a granddaughter of mine. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even adopt one and had to name it and, and, and put the name of Jezebel on it just because they were so mean. But you see, she didn't challenge just Elijah, she challenged God. So let the gods do to me, and more also. She might as well have stood up and shook her fist in the face of God. I had a man that got in the way. We got ready to buy a little church down in Rockingham a great number of years ago. I'm going to tell my wife something. She didn't even know about this whole situation. She's heard us discuss it. We were going to buy a church building that had burnt. It belonged to the church of God. And we had made plans and put the money down. And the real estate man had told me it was ours. And the pastor of the church had told me it was ours. But somehow or another, somebody made a deal. And they came in and sold that church building out from under us for one day. We put down over two-thirds, about three-fourths of the money on Friday morning. We were to close the loan on, on Tuesday morning. Now, I'm telling you, we're not talking about dragging it off down the road for six months. We're talking about in a matter of three or four days. And going to give them cash for the difference. And a man got in between us and the church of God... And somewhere along the line, they felt like they made a better deal because they sold the church to that man. And he walked into the place of business where I was working and made his brags that he had bought that church building out from under our church. And I looked at him and I said, son, I said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, I know people that went from house to house and begged money. I said, they put on singings and they sold hot dogs and hamburgers to raise the money to pay for the brick that went in that building. I said, that building and that property there, I said, was given as, uh, as an, honorary, uh, an, an honorarium under the Lord. I said, it was given to glorify God. I said it was anointed. I said they've been all poured over that church and dedicated and set aside. I said, listen to me. I said, you'll not have no peace. I said, you'll not have no joy. And I said, you listen to me. I said, you will not make a success on that piece of property. I said, God set it aside for a church. It's supposed to be a church. I wouldn't buy this church. Church, let me tell you something. If I was the meanest person in all of the state of North Carolina and the doors of this church was closed and somebody said, preacher, or come to me and said, Kenneth said, you want that building down there for $15 and make a dance hall out of it. Brother, you couldn't run me fast enough to give me enough money to make a dance hall out of the Jamestown Church of God. This building is set aside. It's something special, and that was something special. He laughed at me and walked out the door, and he said, I'll just show you. And I'm telling you, for about three months, it looked like that I was going to be wrong. But I'm telling you, the Lord just raised that thing up in my heart. He said, son, said, hold on. Said, I'm going to show you the salvation of the Lord. Brother Vic, it didn't take me just a few weeks 
she come back and begging us to buy the building. Why? He went to went to his place of business on one morning. He had about 145 or 150 kids in that place. And he went to the place on that next Monday morning. He said, I didn't have enough to even make it worthwhile to open the doors of the nursery. I'm telling you that God is still on the throne. What are you saying, Brother Whiston? I'm saying that you don't get between God and God's people. Hallelujah. You're going to get crushed uh, if you get between God and God's people. Get on the right side. Hallelujah. Stand up for Jesus uh, and be counted. God is still on the throne. Amen. This ain't happening to somebody else. He thought it was funny. He thought he'd really done something. He got in there and he took something that we wanted to use for the cause of Christ and thought he was going to really get by with it. He said, what did you make off the property after you bought it? Not a dime. We turned it right straight over to another church. I, I left. We just turned it over the people and the parsonage and uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the grounds and everything. We, we just turned it right over to another church or to another pastor. When I left, I didn't take nothing with me. I didn't want nothing out of it. You know why? Because it belongs to the Lord. Brother, let me tell you something. We help hang sheetrock, and I put uh, the biggest part of this paneling up, me and William and Brother Tony and, and, and some of the men of the church, we put this paneling up. If I get ready to leave to go down the road tomorrow, Sister Vic, I'm not going to come over here if the church told me I could. I wouldn't come and take a piece of that paneling out or a piece of that molding out. Wouldn't take a light down. I'm telling you, every nail that I've drove, I've done what I've done for the glory of God. I wouldn't want it. I don't want it. Why? Because it belongs to the Lord. Lord is dedicated Amen. unto the Lord. Belongs to God. Oh, let the gods do unto me just what's been done to them. If I don't have your hide, Elijah, I'll have it. I'll have it before long. You see, we're so prone to doubt. We're so prone to use excuses and say, well, that was Elijah. And Elijah was a good godly man. And Elijah was a special man. Yes, he was a special man. But the Lord said he'd do the same thing for me and for you. Just like he did for Elijah if we believe God. But you've got to believe. You've got to believe. We sing the little chorus, only believe, only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. Only believe. In other words, what are we going to do? Are we going to trust God? Those little fellows over there. And, and I like to think of them as young men. Just, just young men. I want to read what, you told, what they told him again. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, we don't hold our tongues. We don't care whether you like it or whether you don't. We're not using any tact. We're going to talk plain and we're going to talk straight to you. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. In other words, if it means going into the fiery furnace, we're not going to serve you. We're not going to bow down. And you know, they could have gone on just a little further, and I'm going to say this in closing. They could have gone on just a little further and said, listen, if you want a reason and if you want a, new, a purpose, our mothers, when we were just little babies and at mama's knee, she told us that thou shalt have no other gods before me. You're not supposed to set up any graven images with any likeness unto anything that flies in the air or that swims in the sea or under the earth nor on this earth and worship it. And listen, we're not careful to answer thee. 
Either God is God. If he's not, then we're going to burn up anyway. We're going to be delivered. But one way or the other, we're going to be free of you. We're going to be loosed of you. We're not going to put up with this. Now, I'm telling you, that's strong words for young people. That's strong words. I believe they were about the size maybe of Jonathan. According to what I can find in the scriptures, they were young men just about the size and the age of Jonathan. They told that king and shook their, might as well have shook their fist and said, don't make no difference. Paul said it in another way. Sister Chester, can't you just hear that man getting ready to go uh, up Mars Hill and get ready to lose his life? He was getting ready to take his head. And maybe one of them soldiers walked up to him over there in the, in the Roman jail and began to talk to him. said, Paul said, what are you going to do about this thing? And old Paul said, it don't make any difference. He said, I fought a good fight, and I finished the course, and I've kept the faith. Now, I believe he could do a little two-step on that across that floor of that jail cell. He said, I've kept the faith. I am now ready to be offered, is what he said. He said, I'm ready to die. Makes no difference. He said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can't you see that godly man about 60 years of age getting ready to be offered? He said it don't make any difference. And there's them three little old boys over there standing before that great king. And they done heated up that furnace seven times hotter than it had ever been heated before. And said, oh king. Said we ain't being a bunch of smart addicts. But we just don't. We're not careful to answer you in this matter. If we live... It's Christ. If it's to die, it's gain. Tim Hill's mama asked him, said, son, said, I believe he asked her, said, mama said, where is Jesus? And she told him, she said, Tim said, he's still in the fire. He's still in the fire. And he wrote a song. About what his mama answered him said he's still in the fire. He's still in the fires. Of our afflictions. The Lord is still in the fire. Of our problems. Every circumstances of our lives. Would you stand with us this morning. He's still there. To deliver us. Makes no difference what comes. And what you're facing. And what you're going through with. You take it a step at a time. He's still right where that he's supposed to be. He's there. He's the answer. He's our hope. Could you just raise your hands this morning and just praise him and thank him because he's still in the fires of our afflictions. He's still there. He's right there. If you're, if you're lost this morning, you're on your way to hell this morning. He's still right where you left him. You backslid this morning. He's right where you left him. The only thing he's saying, coming to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And he's speaking to the lost and making a way for you this morning. I invite you to come. I invite you to come. Will you come and receive Jesus as your Savior? Will you come back to where you left him and take up your cross and follow him? That's all he's interested in this morning. Will you come? Hallelujah. He is here.
here this morning, church. Hallelujah. Whatever you need from him, we're serving a great, big, wonderful, marvelous, glorious God this morning. Who is that God? Who is that God? He's God Jehovah, God Almighty, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the ruler of all nations and the ruler of all men. Big enough to set the world and this world into existence, spoke it into existence. Where there was nothing, he made it. Hallelujah. Yet he's big enough and small enough to be able to live in the very hearts of men. Hallelujah. Who is he? He's God. The Lord Almighty, the King of Kings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love him this morning. I know you do too. Shake hands with one another. Be back tonight at 6 o'clock. I encourage you to be here. Crowd sometimes gets a little small.